Uh, welcome to Ilham. Today, as you know, we're going to be talking to Hannah Alkaf about her debut novel, The Weight of Our Sky. Uh, and as you know, it was written for a young adult audience. Yeah? Uh, my name is Sharon Nelson. I'm part of the Ilham team. And uh, of course, this is Hannah, guest author. And this is Kat, who's interning at Ilham. And Kat is a very young person. Uh, so we thought it would be good to have a younger voice. <laughs> since, <laughs> since the novel is targeted at people who are far younger than I am. So um, we'll start now. I think we're a little, yeah, OK. We'll start now. But uh, for, for anyone who hasn't uh, finished reading the novel, uh, I'll just give you a short synopsis of it. Um, so, the protagonist's name is Malati, okay, and her best friend is Safia. And they are your typical 16-year-old girls. They love music, they love movies, you know. Um, you know, just school girls, they just, they just love pop culture. Like, and, and all of us did at that age, and some of you look like you're still that age, okay, so. And uh, so the, the novel opens actually um, with Safia, who's a more bubbly character, um, the opening event. She's a more bubbly character, and she invites, uh, oh, she persuades Malati actually to um, join her that evening for a film because she idolizes Paul Newman, and it's a Paul Newman film playing at the Rec Cinema. So she convinces Malati, who's a bit more reticent, uh, to go with her. So, you know, these two girls, it's very innocent childhood pursuit. They go off to the movie. And uh, unfortunately, this is the evening of May 13th, 1969. The movie's playing at the Rec Cinema, which was one of the hot spots of that day, of the racial riots of that day. And um, in the middle of the movie, Malati and Safia, or Mel and Saf, uh, get wrenched from each other. And uh, Malati then, you know, she, she goes out into the city and she doesn't recognize it anymore because it's filled with fear, it's filled with threats. And uh, she needs to find her way back to safety, uh, which is, of course, I mean, you can imagine for a 16 year old must be terribly confusing and very, very frightening. And all that time, she's also desperately worried and, you know, uh, praying for her loved ones to remain safe. Uh, there's another heaviness or burden that comes with that, and that is she, she has a lot of anxiety brought on by an inner voice, which she calls her jinn. And the jinn keeps mocking her and taunting her and saying that she brings the worst luck to everyone around her. And, um, well, we're not gonna, gonna do our best not to give away anything, but really that, that characterizes her journey through this time. You know, she's trying to get to a safe place all this time, this inner voice is telling her, you cannot do it. So will she see her mother again? Will she see Saf again? Um, don't know, but <laughs> we hope so. <laughs> so um, I'm just going to start with a with a broad question, uh, and there'll be a Q and A with the audience later. Okay. Um, you have been asked this before, but <laughs> but why did you choose to set this novel about uh, about a young girl with OCD? Yeah? Uh, within the context of me 13. It, surprisingly, yes, I have been asked this question before. Um, I really wanted to write a story about May 13 because I feel like it's a subject we don't talk about um, much or at all. Um, I feel like something this big, something that impacted us this much um, would be the subject of study in other countries you know, would be part of the curriculum, would be taught. Um, but in our textbooks, and some of you probably have encountered a Sejarah textbook much more recently than I have, but in our Sejarah textbooks, May 13th is covered in pretty much about two paragraphs, um, and it's just facts. 
Like this was an incident that happened between the Malays and Chinese. Here is the death toll. Um, here is what we did to fix it. And the fixing it part was like a page and a half of like, oh, we did a great job cleaning up this mess. Um, but the actual mess was probably described in about two paragraphs. And I don't know about you guys, but as a student, when I was studying that, that made zero impact. It was something that I had to memorize for an exam and I had to put down in a paper and get the requisite amount of marks, and then that was it. I just didn't think about it anymore. Like, it didn't matter, like there was no context for it. Um, but the older I got, the more I started thinking about May 13th, and what were the things that weren't being said, and what were the things that we weren't being told. Um, and I started questioning those things more and more, and wondering why we hadn't been given a complete narrative about it. Um, and so that was kind of the, the impetus for that. Um, as for the mental health aspect of it, I've, I'm a big advocate for, for mental health in Malaysia. Um, in fact, my first book, this isn't my first book, it's my first work of fiction, but my first book was actually a locally um, published uh, non-fiction, narrative non-fiction book that explored the landscape of mental illness in Malaysia. Um, from the point of view, not just of, of people who live with mental illness, but people who care for them, people who advocate for them, people who treat them, all, all, all these different um, voices around it. So mental illness is a particular area of interest for me, um, and so they just seemed to intersect perfectly <laughs> when I had the idea for this story. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to drill down a little bit more about what you said um, about uh, it being skimmed over in, in, in history class, yeah? And this, this novel is specifically targeted at a young adult audience. It's a YA novel, which means 12 and up, yeah? Uh, why did you feel it was important to address this age group? Well, because I think the people who actually lived through May 13th, as those voices begin to die out, as that generation begins to pass on, the younger generation is not going to be able to recall any of these stories if they're not told. Who is going to tell them? I wanted to write something that would spark conversation, that would make young people think about our history a lot more. I wanted them to start asking their parents about it, start asking their teachers about it, start asking their grandparents about it. I wanted to get people thinking and talking because I think it's very easy when you are not presented with alternate narratives to just accept what's given to you and then just move on and not think about it at all. And I think it's important for us, especially as a multicultural, multi-religious nation, especially in light of current events, that we sit with the discomfort of our, of our racial past and present. Like, I don't think it's something we can afford to skate over, um, given the current state of our country and the world in general. Mm. Um, and I think, it's, I think it's a tendency, not just of Malaysians, of, but anywhere, to want to avoid that discomfort. But I think it's really important to sit with that discomfort, because it's the only way that we're going to learn anything from it. Um, and I might not be able to change all the minds at this point, but if I can target young people, if I can get young people to start thinking about it and talking about it, then maybe we have some semblance of hope for the future. Okay. So you, you specifically wanted to move away from a prescribed uh, description of May 13, 1969? Um, I wanted to move to a narrative that centered people rather than rather than just plain fact. And that's not to say I wanted to write something that was completely made up or anything like that, but I wanted to center human emotions and human feelings and human experiences, which is what I think was really missing from the narrative that we've been fed in schools. That's a very sterile narrative. Um, but humans are wired for story. Like, the things that stick with us, the things that we remember, are the things that are told to us in story form, right? Um, and the things that, that trigger certain emotions in us, the things that get, get an emotional response from us, those are the things that we remember. And so the things that are taught to you as fact, as like cold, solid, hard fact, those aren't the things that are going to, to stick with you. But if I can describe to you what that scene looked like 
what it smelled like, what it felt like, if I can engage all your senses and your emotions in it, then I feel like, then, well, that's my hope, like, and I'm the author, so you know, <laughs> I, I hope that's what I did. But um, then my hope then is that those are the stories that stick with you. Those are the things that you remember. You made an interesting point just now about, um, about the state of the world today and, and the issue of race. Yeah? And I think I'm going to pass it over to Kat now because she has a question about that. Okay, so um, why did you make the protagonist a Malay girl? Um, and when coming up with the plot or concept for the novel, did you ever toy around with uh, the idea of narrating the story from a different racial perspective? Um, Frank? Oh, yes. Sorry. Um, so my question was, um, why did you make the protagonist a Malay girl? And when coming up with a plot or concept for this novel, did you ever toy around with an idea of narrating the story from a different racial perspective? Um, to be honest, no. I, I never considered writing it from a different perspective. Um, and that's for a couple of reasons. One, I don't really have the right. I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a Malay person. <laughs> I'm a Malay woman. Um, I don't want to presume that I understand what an event of this magnitude was like for someone who was not of a majority privileged race. That's not my lane to write. I can try to, to make sure within the narrative that I do write that those perspectives are represented, but I don't feel that it's my place to take that story from somebody else. I'm a Malay person. I grew up with, uh, in Malaysia, I'm privileged. I'm the majority. Um, and I just, there's a power differential at work there where I, I don't get to, I don't feel that I get to co-opt um, someone else's view of the situation. Um, so my, my main characters, yes, they will usually be, be Malay because that's the perspective that I'm coming from. I would be really happy if somebody else wrote a perspective from a different race. Um, but I don't think that it's appropriate that I be that person, if that makes sense. It's complete sense, <laughs> in a way. Um, I'm half Malay, half Chinese, so I feel like that's something that I've always thought about in terms of identity. But, um, but to explore more, more about race and identity, given the book settings, I was also wondering, like, in your book, your race seems to be kind of a, a concrete, and black and white kind of concept. So however, this was 50 years ago. Um, now race is seen more and more as a social construction that also has real implications. So did you ever envision your book to set out clear racial definitions? Or well, obviously you were writing from the perspective of a Malay girl in the 50s. What I was trying to do, because it is historical fiction, um, I was trying to stay true to what the perspective might have been at the time which would have been very solidly racial lines. Well, race would have been like a pretty solid construct um, at the time in Malaysia. Um, I do agree that it's a lot more fluid now and that even you were saying that um, you are half Malay and half Chinese and that has its own perspective as well. Like I, I wouldn't mess with a biracial perspective either because I don't know what that's like. You have a very specific set of experiences that are different from me as a as a regular Malay person or as or, you know, another person who is fully Chinese or anything like that. You have a different, uh, you bring a different sensibility, a different point of view to things, right? So yeah, when I, when I wrote it, because it was set during the 60s and, and, and race was seen a certain way, that's kind of how I, had, that's the parameters I had to operate within, if that makes sense. Generally, you are making sense. <laughs> No, you are. <laughs> You're doing fine. You're doing fine. So, yeah. And so, would it have been possible to reimagine the book to take into account the grey areas and blurry lines that necessarily come up in any critical um, conversation regarding race today? Um, to take it away from these like set boundaries. Um, I'm sure that it would be possible. It would have. It might have become a very different book. Um, and and. I'm, I'm glad it's sparking these types of conversations where you can sort of contemporize the things that are happening based on the perspectives that you have now. But in historical fiction, while it is fiction and you have some leeway 
for example, people have pointed out the language is a little bit anachronistic, you know, some of the terms and stuff wouldn't have been used in 69, but I'm writing for a contemporary audience and I, I do kind of have to still make it relatable to, to, the, to the teens who are going to read it, um, make it accessible. Um, but at the same time, I don't want to mess too much with uh, fact, with what the world was, would have been like for a 16-year-old Malay girl in Malaysia in 1969. I don't want to take too many liberties with that, not with a narrative like this where I feel like the, that uh, really colours how, how the book goes. Um, so yeah, I'm glad that, that you can take the themes of the book and contemporize it based on what we know of race today and the kind of discussions we're having today. But um, I, I mean, I, to me the book was written the way it had to be written for what it was. I'm going to stop saying, does that make sense? I hope it does though. <laughs> yeah, I think you're on solid ground there. <laughs> I'd, I'd actually like to pivot now to uh, something you brought up in the very first, uh, very first question about mental illness yeah? and mental health. And you are, you are a passionate advocate of mental health. Okay? Um, Malati has unyielding anxiety. There's an ongoing, relentless conversation in her head with with, uh, you know, and, and a voice that keeps telling her that she's simply not good enough for anything, you know? And uh, you, uh, has everyone read part of the book or? No, okay, okay, so, so you, I don't think OCD is actually mentioned in the novel. It is in the, in the, in the introduction, I think, by Hannah. But you'll pick it up because, you know, there's, uh, this is not a spoiler. I mean, she, <laughs> she, she kind of like taps in sets of three. Yeah, what know. it is, is she, yeah. her intrusive thoughts take the form of um, bad things happening to her mother. Um, her intrusive thoughts take the form of, um, of, of all the, the terrible ways that her mother could die at any given moment. And she feels that the only way that she can protect her mother is by adhering to this increasingly complicated system of rituals that involve counting and tapping. Um, and if you are familiar with OCD at all, even though it is not mentioned on the page, this is something that you would pick up on, I think, fairly immediately. Um, but yeah, just to give a clearer picture of, of what's... That's not a spoiler. That's literally like the first thing you encounter when you read the first chapter. But yeah. Um, yeah, so, so my question would be, um, it features prominently it influences the protagonist's uh, actions quite a lot, greatly, actually. Um, and the voice in her head is that of a jinn, okay, or, you know, what we call a genie, right? Um, not a very nice genie, though. I don't think he grants you three wishes or anything like that. But um, I would like to ask you, actually, what made you, because there does seem to be some awareness on Malati's part that it is an illness, you know? So I'd like to ask, what made you use a jinn as the messenger or the voice of, of this illness? Okay. Um, I'm Malay. I might have mentioned this once or twice, but <laughs> I'm Malay. Um, and in our cultures and in our communities, um, even now, not just back then, but even now, um, it was very easy to look at symptoms of mental illness, illness and say that you were being possessed or that you were being disturbed by spirit. Um, it's very easy to look at mental illness and blame it on spiritual weakness. Um, one of the things that I was most fascinated by when writing my book on non, like my nonfiction book on mental illness, was this intersection in Malaysia of um, mental illness and faith. Because in Malaysia, you can't really run away from faith. Even if you are not yourself a practicing person, you are surrounded by it all the time. People in your family are people of faith. You know, there are temples on the streets, mosques, churches, little like shrines, everywhere, right? Um, and in every conversation that I had uh, while working on this book on mental illness, um, faith always came into play. Right? People were taken <laughs> for exorcisms by overzealous parents. People were taken to bomos and taken to all sorts of faith healers and, 
and, and just all sorts of things like that. And, um, and it would be nice to say that this happened in the past and we have moved on and we have excellent mental health facilities and all these things, but we haven't. We haven't. It's still very common in the Malay community to blame symptoms of mental illness on, on spiritual weakness. Um, and it's one of the things that I really wanted to explore. Um, and I just, honestly, I wanted to write a narrative where the main characters, mental illness and religion, are part of who she is, but don't necessarily define her. She's a whole person who just happens to have these two things that she deals with. And that's just part of who she is. So the narrative, while it is about a Malay Muslim girl with a mental illness, it's not really about her being any of those things. It's just her being this person trying to make it through this terrible situation and, and make it back to the one person that she loves the most. Like, that's really all it is. So was the jinn, sorry, am I getting this right? Was the jinn a device for her to have this inner conversation? The jinn would have been how mental illness would have been perceived at the time. She would have 100% believed that she had a jinn in her head and it was controlling her body, and it was controlling her thoughts, it was holding her hostage basically, holding her mind and her body hostage. And, and, and she would have believed that, that the tapping and things would have, would have been to appease it. Um, it. It's not necessarily, I mean obviously I wrote it in, into a novel and so it's like a literary device, but it's also like a real thing that people deal with even today. Um, and, how, and how people sort of rationalize mental illness to themselves in the absence of medical treatment for it. So. Okay, thank you. Um, I think Kat has, uh, has a couple of books that she'd like to mention, yeah. And a question, yes. <laughs> okay, so um, there's one also about OCD and stuff. So there have been other young adult uh, fiction books, which uh, whose protagonists also suffer from the same stream of um, OCD, so they come to loved ones' doubts and incompleteness and order and symmetry, which leads to anxiety. Um, so these books, like Kissing Doorknobs by Terry um, Spencer, follows Tara Sullivan, a girl with OCD, and a family who don't really understand her mental condition. So she avoids stepping on cracks because she doesn't want to hurt her mum. And, um, and these become like her daily rituals. And another book, like Compulsion by Heidi Ayarbe, where which follows Jake Martin, who obsesses over his prime numbers. Um, and he, con he basically thinks that they're, he's controlling, like they're, they control his fate and destiny, and he terms this as magic. So were you inspired by any such books? Um, I read a lot of those books because I wanted, before I even started writing, because I wanted to see how OCD had been portrayed for young adults, in young adult literature. I wanted to see, and I wanted to see from, from people who, had, who really had OCD and who, um, who had read this kind of literature, what they felt was good representation versus bad representation, and how I could honor those experiences in the best way possible. The thing is, even if you yourself, um, are living with a specific mental illness, whether it's OCD or depression or anxiety, you have to know that your experience cannot be representative, representative, that's it, of everyone's experience. It's just like, I wrote a book about a, a Malay girl as well, and that can't be taken as representative of every experience of May 13th, do you know what I mean? Um, but when there are so few people writing about a certain topic, then you sort of become a representative for everybody, um, even if you don't mean to be. Uh, I took the OCD aspect of the book very, very seriously because there have been so many cases of books about, with protagonists with mental illness or about mental illness that have been written really poorly um, and that don't help in the combating of stigma and don't help young readers especially see themselves on a page, which is what you want. You want to write a book that helps marginalized people feel seen. That's what you want. And that's a great responsibility there to get it right. So yes, I read a huge range of uh, young adult literature specifically, but in general, 
books that featured OCD or had uh, a main protagonist with OCD. The most popular one that, uh, off the top of my head, that you can get in the bookstores right now is John Green's Turtles All the Way Down. John Green himself has OCD, um, so that's a pretty true representation of what it would be like. I won't speak to other parts of the plot. Uh, <laughs> It's, it's a John Green book, but uh, the representation of OCD in particular is very affecting because you can tell that he has lived through it himself. Um, and it's still something he has trouble talking about in interviews and such, um, which I think you'll find most, of, most authors um, uh, are a little more reticent about talking about the state of their mental health. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I think it's great that there are more and more books that especially for young people that are trying to represent different aspects of mental illness. Um, but I, I would really want to make sure that they get it right before I put those into the hands of young readers um, because bad representation can do so much harm to a child who's reading it. So. Okay, so we've got two big things going on here. We've got a, you know, a serious mental uh, issue, the OCD, we've got the race riots, very big things going on. You know, your time. regular light beach read. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> For a tsunami, maybe. <laughs> yes. Okay. But um, what I'd like to ask you is uh, twofold. The first thing would be, um, what light did uh, Mel's OCD shed on the um, events of May 13th? Because there's, there's an interplay there of, of racial identity, superstition, faith, as you said, uh, illness, you know. So how did it, how did it uh, shed more light on, on the huge events of that day? I'm not sure you can talk about it shedding light so much as, <coughs> sorry, excuse me. Um, so much as it informs all the interactions and decisions that she makes as she goes throughout the day. I'm not sure that you can say that it shed light, like some, it gave her some you know, divine inspiration about like, what was happening um, with these race riots. Um, Perhaps not for her, but for the reader. I think you'd have to ask the readers. Um, I don't want to presume to speak for, for readers um, because every once a book is, is out in the world and it's out of your hands, then it's no longer really the author's book. It, it's a book that belongs to readers and you are free to interpret it as you wish and it's not really my place to tell you how to interpret it. Do you know what I mean? Like It's a work that I have now given to you, um, assuming some of you have read it. <laughs> but it's a work that I have passed on. Um, and, and it's not really for me to say then that you should read it like this and you should read it like this because it is, it is how you read it. Like every book is a personal experience for the person who's reading it. Um, what I would hope that you would take away from it is that in the midst of all the terrible things that happen in the world, there are still people who are striving just to do their best and do the right thing. And no matter what they're struggling with internally that you can't see, there are still people who are working through that and trying to do the right thing. Um, and that's the light that I hope people get from it. But I don't mean to create a character that's inspiration porn for other people. It's just who she is. She has a mental illness and that's, that's just what she's dealing with. That's her reality. Um, she was never meant to be some inspirational filter for you to see the world. She was just a character who exists in the book, and that's her journey, and that's it. What you take from it then is up to you. But yeah, she was never meant to be like, oh, this is how you should be. Like, this is, oh, you know, yeah, you, you know, then people share these like stories of people with disability or people with mental illness on Facebook, and like, oh, look how far they've come. People with disability and mental illness don't exist for you to be inspired by them, you know what I mean? Sure. Yeah. yeah. Like, so I, I, again, like, I hesitate to say, like, you know, this is, this is what her, her condition does this for you in the narrative. Like, it's, it's how you see it, um, and it's just something that she's dealing with, just like probably 80% of the people that you meet on a given day. And that's it. 
Okay. Uh, I think we will go a little bit into the process by which this book came to be. Yeah, your research. I think Kat has a question about research. Um, so how did you balance the historical facts from newspapers, like dealing with subjective accounts from other survivors, um, with the fiction? And how did you go about conducting research for this novel? Oh, I could talk about research all day. Let's talk about research. Yes. Um, I come from a journalist background. So pivoting from, this is my first novel. I've never, I'd never attempted a novel before this. I had written some short stories. I was trying to challenge myself to see if I could write something that was 50 to 60,000 words long without like wanting to die. Um, so I approached it very much like I would have approached writing like a long form feature. Um, I looked for people to interview. I read all the literature I could get my hands on on the subject. Um, including the white paper that the government put out, all sorts of things. Um, I read as many personal narratives as I could. That took some digging. Um, it's a bit difficult to find, but, you know, found them. Um, I, and the thing you have to understand about writing historical fiction as well is that there are so many layers, especially in this story, there are so many layers of research that you have to do because there are so many layers of identity that you are trying to pull from. So you're not just trying to bring the race riots to life, that's a specific incident in itself, but you're trying to bring to life Kuala Lumpur in 1969, which is a completely different entity from Kuala Lumpur now. What did it smell like? What did it look like? What did it feel like to be walking along the streets? What kind of people would you have met? What were they wearing? What kind of music were they listening to? What kind of cars were on the road? What kind of public transport was available? There are so many little things that you have to look into in order to make a world like that come alive for a reader. World building is usually something that fantasy authors talk about or get asked about, but honestly, historical fiction is a different kind of world building, right? Um, so there's that. And then I had to research OCD in 1969. What kind of treatment options would have been available, which is to say, not many. <laughs> um, uh, I had to, I, had, I mean, at one point, I went a bit crazy with the research, I'm not going to lie to you. At one point, it was uh, past midnight, probably about 1 a.m., and I had a map of uh, 60s Malaysia in one window and Google Maps in the other because I was trying to determine whether my travel time for Malati as she walked from one place to another would be correct. And I'm like, <laughs> in my head, I'm like, nobody's going to care if you said 12 minutes versus 7 minutes. And then the other part of my head is like, but I care. Um, so yeah, when you want to talk about levels of research, uh, there was a lot of research that went into it. Um, as to how the fact and fiction bits like, had to melt together. Um, honestly, that was by feel alone, like what felt right. Um, I didn't want to, I knew what I didn't want to do was mess too much with people's memories of what happened. Um, that felt disrespectful. Um, and, and, and this was such a huge incident and people had entrusted me with all these stories and emotions and feelings that they had gone through. And I didn't want to be disrespectful in any way to that. I wanted to honor those memories. Um, so I was careful, I, was, I had to try to be very careful in writing it to make sure that I, was, I wasn't overly misrepresenting something in the name of like, I don't know, just in the name of good fiction or whatever. Um, that, was, that was a big consideration for me because those were personal stories that were trusted and trusted to me. Uh, so, but yeah, if, <laughs> I had so much fun with it. I, am, I, I enjoy research so much that sometimes I feel like I would not stop to actually write a book I would just keep researching all the time, and if somebody could pay me to do that, I would be so happy. But no, you actually have to write books when you're an author, so, yeah. Okay, you have a background in journalism. I'm glad you brought that up, and you've done some investigative pieces as well. So, and you also mentioned in the book that you talked to survivors of May 13th, yeah? So you had first-person accounts of this. What? was the most surprising thing you observed or uncovered? Uncovered. Um, I think um, there, were, there were two things. 
The first was that I honestly didn't understand how terrifying it was. It sounds, it sounds silly that you wouldn't know how scary it would be to be caught in the middle of a race riot. But I honestly did not understand how much violence was involved and how traumatizing it would have been to witness that. I honestly had no concept of it. It sounds so silly now because obviously, obviously there were deaths on the street. Obviously that was a terrifying time for anybody. But until I, I heard those descriptions of exactly what happened, until I, I saw for myself those accounts, I had no concept of how violent and how terrifying it was. And people, people will come up to me at events like this and say, was this real? Did it really happen like this? This is something that sounds like it happens in movies or in countries that aren't ours. But it is real. And we are, we are right now in the heart of KL. We are not far removed from the center of where all these things happened. We're not that far. If you took a walk now, a lot of those things still exist. The Rex has been restored, right? So, so and uh, in fact, just a few weeks ago, they told me, somebody told me that they did a, a sort of walkthrough uh, of the Rex and they read, um, they read that chapter that occurs in the Rex while they were in the restored wrecks. These places still exist. We're not that far removed from this history. Um, I've lost my train of thought. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't remember. Okay. I don't I remember what the question was at this point. I've just kind of rambled on. I'm very sorry. What no, no, that's again? fine. I was just asking you what the, what the most surprising oh. thing to okay. you was. So yeah. the violence. The violence mm. and, and just connecting it to the places that you see. Um, every day. Uh, that hadn't occurred to me uh, before I started writing it, when I started doing the research okay. for it. But the other thing that surprised me is really just how much humanity comes through in the in, within the inhumanity. The number of stories that I heard of people who helped other people, people who went out of their way, people who put themselves in danger to help other people, like that was also that was also a, a, that was a more pleasant surprise yeah. and sad that it had to come through in such circumstances. But yeah. those were two very contrasting and somehow surprising things for me. And again, maybe I came to it just being a little too naive about how things actually were. But um, yeah, those were those were things that surprised me the most. Okay, lovely. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to hand this over to Kat now. So. <laughs> This one kind of reflects back to um, what you mentioned earlier about how you, you, people write about the May 13th riots like in a very sterile fashion. Um, so Dr. Kwa Kia Sung actually republished his book on May 13th on the 50th anniversary. So his account of the riot focuses primarily on its political underpinnings. Was it your intention to emphasize the emotional aspects of the riot um, rather than the political history? Yes. Um, and I, I did that intentionally because it was a book written from the perspective of the 16-year-old targeted to its young adults. Now, these days, I know many young adults are far more politically aware, right? But back in the day, politics would have been something that was happening to the adults and you as a 16 year old would be getting, getting whiffs of it, but you wouldn't be directly involved in it. You would have still been considered a child and therefore your place was away from what the adults were talking about. Um, and frankly, at 16, while you're dealing with the stuff in your head and the stuff in your streets and trying to find your mother and all these things, I, I just, to me, Malati's main concern wouldn't have been the politics of the time, because the politicians weren't the people on the streets killing other people or saving other people, right? Um, so to me, it wasn't, uh, I tried to write in enough to give readers a general sense of what was happening in the background, but to me, that wasn't the point of the book. The point of the book was how stuff like that impacts people on the ground who have to deal with the consequences of that stuff which is the thing that we don't talk about enough. 
so yeah, I I had no interest in the political side of things. Not the, did a, like his books are great. Like I've read them, but they, they were not what I set out to write. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we have one last question, and then we'll hand it over to the audience. Uh, so, a country has lived through May 13th. We've also lived through May 9th, 2018. Okay, and if Malati were real, <laughs> but she is, I suppose, you know, yeah, wandering around, she'd be 66 now. So, what do you think she'd have to say? about the past year, leading up to the events of the past week? Begin with the mic. Yes. Okay. Where do I begin with that one? Um, I think she would have been cautiously optimistic, as many of us were, after, after May 9th. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I was, I was directly involved with like Pulang Mengundi stuff and all that. So, so I understand this wave of optimism that carried us through. And I think Melati would have been very much affected by that as well. In a good way? In a good way. In yes. a good way. Right. But I think at a certain point, I think you get tired. Okay. <laughs> I think she'd be tired, to be honest, because if you've lived through something that huge in the past and you see you live long enough to see the same shit sorry are there children here oh <laughs> we have you to ban you now and you, i know i'm so <laughs> sorry i don't be a first to be banned uh, from an art gallery that's a real young adult word uh, <laughs> yeah it is it is uh young adults use far worse words to be honest um yeah, come on cat <laughs> but to to live long enough then to see the same cycle the same thing the same thing <laughs> thing, cycle through again is I think at one point it's just a point of exhaustion okay. like when do you learn when do you learn and for Malati in particular who has already lived through so much of that stuff and wow I really am talking like she's real but um, mm, who's already is. lived through so much of that stuff who's already had these conversations who's done this work only to come back to a world that's reached this point once again um, I think I think, as with many of us, that sometimes it's hard to, s it's hard to hang on to the optimism. Yeah. Okay. And I think Malati being like any of us, Malati being human, um, that sometimes it's hard to hang on to optimism. Um, but as most of us do, we continue in whatever way we can. Sure. Um, by either fighting back or by just living as full and joyous and inclusive a life as possible. Okay, thank you. I was hoping to end on a high I note. I know, I was <laughs> trying. I really tried. You did like, very well at the end, I think. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I'm yeah. sure the audience has some questions for you. So, um, anything? We will... Okay, there we go. Need a... Well... Hi, uh, my name is Nisa. Uh, I haven't read your book yet, but maybe after today. I'm just curious if there's anyone um, in your background or family or friends who is facing OCD, which made you have that sense of, or maybe I'll try to touch on this matter in, in your book. Yeah. Um, I tend to skate around questions that ask about that because I'm not always comfortable talking about my own mental health as well, um, but I tr I'm trying to be more open about it, right? So I don't think, but my general response would usually be, I don't think you can honestly state in this day and age that you or a person that you know somehow is not affected by mental illness, whether it's OCD or anxiety or depression, bipolar, whatever. Um, and all I really say when people ask me questions like that is that I pull from personal experience. Um, and you can take that as my own or someone else's close to me, but it comes from personal experience. So um, I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> Thank you. Anyone else? Over oh, there? Okay. Your jacket. <laughs> it's very cool. Thank you. 
Hi, my name is Juliana. Uh, say if you are a friend of Melati, what would you do or advise her to help her overcome her mental illness? That would have been a rough one because I, I would be speaking from the perspective of now where treatments are available, where, where there are options, where there are options where you don't have to, where you don't have to deal with what the, your culture is, is saying and what your, your, you know, your family is saying. Um, so now I would be like, let's take you to a psychiatrist. Let's take you to a KK, get you a referral. Let's, let's, whatever it is, let's get you some options. Let's get you some treatment. Um, back then, back then you would have had to understand that there wasn't that availability for her. Um, there were psychiatrists. Um, but a few, a handful, um, and, and there was still a stigma of visiting one because you, people still assumed that you, they, would, they would have you lobotomized. They would cut part of your brain out, the sick part of your brain would be cut out, and, and that's it, that's how they would treat you. Um, or, or you know, that, that everybody would think you were crazy for going to the crazy doctor. Um, back then, to be honest, Malati would not have had very many options. It's just, it's just the truth. I don't mean to sound like really hopeless about it, but honestly, it's the truth. Um, I guess if I was someone in the 60s and trying to advise Melati based on what I knew and based what the options were at the time, that I would... I, I'm, honestly, I, I don't even know how to approach that. There were no options. Um, I would try to be the support system that she needed. If she were having a rough time, if she was spiraling, I would try to be there for her, and I would try to help her through those spirals. Um, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to give advice. My advice as a Malay person in the 60s would probably have been like, pray. Like, <laughs> that's what we had. Um, and, and in the book, that's what Melati does. She prays, she, her mother takes her to various faith healers and things like that. That's what was available to people at the time. So you could say that they did everything right for the time, but it, it still didn't help. No. That was really somber and pessimistic, but you know, yeah. sorry. <laughs> Hi there, my name is Diana. Um, you started off today's discussion talking about one of your departure points for writing the book was looking at the curriculum of young adults today and that the incident is very factual based, doesn't talk about emotions, lots about what they did, but you hope to find emotions through the riots. So looking at today's readers, today young adult readers and today's teachers, how um, would you, how do you think how do you hope that your book informs their understanding not just what happened but how that informs their lives and decisions and uh, the, the the path that Malaysia has gone down now how can they see the difference and how can it inform them as adults who may become voters? I hope it's not me become voters. I hope they become adults who actually vote. Um, that's really important. But um, my main hope for writing a, a, a narrative about me, that did not just a fact-based thing, but a narrative about it, was that, as I said in the beginning, that it would spark conversations. I wanted young people to be more curious about it. I wanted young people to start thinking about not only this incident in our history, in our history but the way that our history is taught to us and presented to us, and who gets to write the history books, and why they're written the way that they are, um, and why, and why May 13th is covered in two paragraphs, whereas the, the after effects of May 13th are covered in like a page. Like why, why, who gets to decide these things? I wanted young people to start thinking about those things. I have no great presumptions about my book making it into the curriculum and, and changing everything. Like I don't, I don't harbor those hopes. If it happens, that's great, awesome. Um, and I know a couple of international schools that have put it on reading lists now for their grade seven students or grade eight or, or whatever they decide. Um, but my real hope was just that young Malaysians would pick it up and start paying attention to our history. 
because I don't think we think enough about how we got here to this point. And I don't just mean we as in like individual, as individuals. I mean we as a country. How did we get to this point? How did we come to this collective conclusion, these collective conclusions? Like who gave us that information and why did they present to it, it to us in this way? I wanted people to start talking, start asking their parents about it. Because generally, the older generation, unless, you, uh, for the most part, like in my family at least, it wasn't something you talked about even. Um, it was something, it was unpleasant business, so you didn't talk about it. And we needed to start talking about it. <laughs> we needed to start somewhere. So I was just hoping that writing a book for young people meant that young people would start asking questions. That's all I really wanted. That was the first step that I wanted. And everything else is a bonus. <laughs> but I wanted to start young people thinking about it. Get them on that trajectory first. Big changes will come later. But that curiosity needs to start first. That lack of complacency about where we are needs to start first. So um, that, was, that was the goal. That was the goal. It, it seems like a small goal. Like other authors have a lot bigger dreams than I do, I think. Movie adaptations and all that stuff. But me, I just wanted people to start thinking. <laughs> and that was it. One, oh, we've got three. Okay. Uh, yes, first, second. Hi. Uh, I just wanted to say congratulations. Oh, this is you. a beautiful book. Thank I, you. I, yeah, I read it, and you keep saying it's for young adults, yeah. and you, you, the writing style and everything is very much so, but I think it's very refreshing that you've put this very heavy subject in a way that's very approachable, and like you said, for the personal part of it. So for me also, I've been in Malaysia for almost 30 years, so I, I understand it, and my understanding also is very much these few paragraphs and this very the political part of it and why it happened. So it's, it's so nice to read. And I would say also this is something that not just young adults, but every Malaysian who hasn't experienced it and wants to kind of have this personal or a slightly personal understanding. It's beautiful. So really Thank you congratulations. So much. Yeah, it's Thank wonderful. You. And I am going to recommend it to our children's English teacher. Our kids have grown and left. Oh. Uh, but yeah, because it's wonderful and for young people to have that experience. So I have two questions um, very quickly. One is you mentioned that with all of your research and you, you had stories, you talked to people and stuff, so I'm just wondering if you have any effort or any way to put those together because like you said, those personal accounts and, and hearing what people went through is very wonderful. So is that anything you're thinking about doing? And then my second thing is you talked about, you did a lot of research, like how long actually did you spend? I was so curious, like a year, five years? Because it sounded like you were really digging into it. So thank you. Um, for the first one, um, I, um, I, I think there are already projects in the works of collating stories about May 13th. Um, the people that I spoke to didn't necessarily want to be named. Uh, and which is why in the acknowledgments it's just sort of a blanket like thank you to the survivors who, who shared their stories with me um, but I, I do believe that there is a, at least one project that I've heard of in the works of collecting those stories not, not my project but that I've heard of um, to ask to the second question how long <laughs> oh gosh um, probably not as long as five years but probably like six months to a year of just um, and the research is ongoing as well because when you when you start writing the book as you as as your narrative veers off um, and takes its own like twists and turns and stuff you have to research to make sure that those turns <laughs> make sense um, so so it was really an ongoing process of, of research research and then start writing the book and then keep like there's still a layer of research that needs to happen as you're writing because you always want to make sure that what you're doing makes sense. Um, so at one point, I think th there was a gun that appears in like one scene, but I emailed like a gun expert and was like, what gun would have made sense in 1969 in Malaysia? Can you tell me? Like, what, what would the guards have been using? Can you, can you like give me some kind of idea? I don't even mention it in the end, but I wanted to make sure that I had, at least for me, a solid grounding of what it would have been like. But yeah, it was just an ongoing process of, of research um, that didn't really stop until like the final 
page was written. Um, yeah, but I, like I said, I love research, man. I could, I could buy a million books about a specific topic just to write like one paragraph about it, but it's great. Okay. I think there's a, yes, there's a lady. Like we have a bit of time, yeah. Uh, about, yes, on the bench, yeah. Thank you, uh, Diana. Uh, going back to your uh, original intent or hope about this book, and uh, as you said, to spark some discussion and interest about the past, the history, but definitely also about the mental illness part. So I'm just curious, what has the reception, the feedback, the review been so far on those two very important topics? Uh, it's a good question. Um, some people have actually asked me, like, why did you put two such heavy topics in one book? Like, you could have devoted a book each to these topics, you know? Um, as to reviews, though, um, the, the book is, is published in America. It's published by Simon & Schuster. So a thing that happens when a new book is released is that uh, you get trade reviews. And these are reviews written for primarily for an audience of booksellers and librarians, people who are going to actually push your book out to the public. Um, and those reviews were great. Um, I had, start, this is gonna sound really braggy. <laughs> I apologize in advance. Um, I had starred reviews from Kirkus, uh, from the School Library Journal, from Publishers Weekly, um, and good reviews from, from a bunch of other places. Um, <laughs> Goodreads is a whole other thing. Um, and and, and I, I heard very sage advice from, from author friends of, at some point, you just need to stop reading the reviews because, like I said before, once the book is out, it doesn't belong to you anymore and it's not your place to go to somebody who's written a review that you might not agree with and say, you read it wrong. There's no such thing as reading it wrong. <laughs> you read it how you read it. A book is a personal experience. Um, so I stopped going on Goodreads. <laughs> I don't know how they're talking about it there. Um, I'm not sure I want to know. Um, but I have had readers email me directly or message me personally to say that they felt very seen by the OCD representation. Um, that they hadn't seen those thoughts laid out on the page quite like that before. And I had people thanking me for the Malaysian, young, young Malaysians thanking me for, for being able to see themselves in a mainstream book available globally, not just at home. Um, on the flip side, I've seen some reviews before I stopped looking at Goodreads <laughs> that said things like, oh, you know, the representation of OCD got very um, hard to read because it was boring and rep repetitive and tedious. But really, that's kind of what OCD is. It's boring and repetitive and tedious. It's not this, like, quirky, like, habits of, like, oh, I must arrange things by the same color, you know, when people say, oh, I'm so OCD. It's not that. It's tiring. It's exhausting. It's tedious. It's... It's terrible, it's painful. A lot of the times, it's just boring. <laughs> and I want you to feel that through the text. I don't just want to tell you and then she did it again. Like, I want you to feel how boring and repetitive it is through the text. So some people got that. People who have OCD got that immediately and were like, yes, this is what it feels like. People who don't um, tend to be like, why did you focus so much on this? I would rather have read more about the racial stuff. And that's fair. Like, it's just, it's just how you approach things. But overall, to answer your question in a more specific way, um, the response has been surprisingly good uh, for a book written by someone, a Malaysian in Malaysia, about Malaysia, devoid of a white perspective, devoid of a Western perspective, and published in the West. Um, I had no expectations for how it was going to do, um, but to me, it's found its readers. Um, and that, that is enough. Like, it doesn't need to hit, like, bestseller lists or be made into movies or whatever. It'd be cool if it did. I won't say no. But it found its readers, and I think that's the most important thing. We'll take two more questions. I think uh, the, the lady yeah. in purple first, and then we'll end with the... This section has been very quiet. I'm wondering why... Okay, last question. Okay. Yeah. Hi, um, I'm Carol. Um, congratulations on your book. Um, I'm, I'm one of those who attended the writing workshop at 
Rex, and we, I think we are the ones who read the scene. Yeah. Don't spoil it for anybody It's very interesting, and, and that's why I started reading the book. I haven't finished it, sorry, but it's good so far. Um, so, uh, because uh, as part of the writing workshop, we talked about May 13 as this mm -hmm. event, and you mentioned it in your introduction as well, mm -hmm. which still affects us to this day. Mm -hmm. um, I guess one of the positive things about uh, May 9 for me is the increased amount of press freedom we've had. Okay, so, you know, everything else, I don't want to comment, but... <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I, I don't know if it's co coincidental, but this year, there's, it is the 50th anniversary of May 13, and there's a spread in Malaysia, Kini, about some of the yeah, events yes. and stuff, and also our age, the star. Yeah. <coughs> and in my years of growing up and living here and all that, it's never been such, you know, I mean, it's not huge, but, you know, there has been nothing when I was growing up. So, to me, that's a huge thing that people, there is a space right now, whether mm -hmm. in the media or culture space, to start talking about it. So, when you first started writing the book, have you felt this, or was it coincidental, or, you know, was it, was it part of it? And my second question is, and again, this is something that, as part of the writing workshop, we kind of discuss, is like, um, if there were to be, like, a memorialization of the event, you know, how would, how would you or Melati, would you, you know, imagine it to be if we wanted to commemorate this? Thank you. All right, let's do that first one first, um, which was uh, the, yeah, the coincidental. Okay, I started writing this book at the end of 2016, and I had no agent, I had no experience in writing a novel, I definitely didn't have a publisher. I had no idea when I was going to finish. And once I was finished, I had no idea that it was going to be picked up. It really all just sort of worked out <laughs> that it was published in the 50th anniversary. Um, and I was not thinking about what the current climate was like, what kind of space there was for the narrative. I just wanted to write the story because it had been living in my head for about six months before I started putting words on paper. Um, and it started taking shape. So. I had no way of predicting that it was going to be published this year, <laughs> basically. That was just a sort of cosmic luck for me, like the stars aligning and suddenly it happened. Um, it just so happens that I managed to finish the book and it managed to get an agent and publishing schedules are such that books are, published, are signed two years before they're published. That's just how it worked. I had no idea that this was all going to happen. <laughs> I couldn't have predicted it. When they told me that you're going to be published in 2019, I did the math and I was like, oh, it's the 50th year anniversary. How topical. <laughs> but I had no idea, I had no concept that Malaysia, that, that we were going to go through May 9th. That, I couldn't have predicted any of this. Um, it just sort of happened to me. <laughs> so. Um, I'm glad there is a space for it, and for people who have not seen it, the Malaysia Kini micro site about May 13th is very, very good, um, and you should t definitely take a look at it. Uh, I, I think it's still up. It's definitely still, it's up. still up. Yeah, it's definitely still up. It's very good. They put a lot of work into that, and the rage reports are also very good. Um, your second question was about, sorry, I'm... Memorialize. Memorializing. Yeah. Um, and what form that would take. Yeah. I don't think Malati was the type of person to demand huge public memorials for such things. I think what she would hope for is that people would just finally like, start learning from the past instead of covering it up. Um, and, and a memorial, I think, for her would be almost more painful than it would be joyful or hopeful, do you know what I mean? Because she actually lived that time. Um, but what I would love to see personally is the areas that were affected um, having monuments or explanations to what happened. I, I'd love to see, like, not just at the Rex, but like along Pataling Street and things like that. Just, there are places that do history walks, right, that have plaques on buildings that tell you what happened on this site. And on. I would love to see our history woven into our everyday. That's what I would love to see, so that you always have it with you. And it's not, 
a memorial necessarily because that sounds, even when you say it, like a thing that is distant and removed and, and, and something that you look at rather than experience. But if you were walking along Pataling Street and you could read as you went along what happened at particular locations, um, if, you could, if you could sort of re-experience that or reimagine that for yourself as you were just going about your business, then I think that would be more fitting um, than, than something that, that we would call a memorial, if that makes sense. That makes sense. Okay, I think this gentleman has a question, and then we'll Hi. end with you. Yeah, sorry, a, a couple of questions. Uh, the first thing you said was uh, you wanted the book to get young adults or the young to talk about question history and uh, official narrative. So, have you got? Has anyone come up to you, uh, total strangers, and you know, uh, presented that? I mean. Uh, that, that's the first thing. The second one is how did you get published by a U.S. Oh. Uh, publisher? The process of that. And the third one, sorry, is a, any any uh, Malaysian storytellers that sort of inspired you or okay. inspired you in the past? Okay. Uh, the first question being how have young people basically received the book uh, and like Malaysian young readers specifically? And the answer to that is people have been very. I feel like excited is a weird word for such a heavy book, but lot, sort of energized that that somebody is telling Malaysian stories on an international stage and that's not to say I'm the first like I, I never want to presume that there, there have been people who have been published overseas before me like I'm, I'm not special that way but I think young people were just energized to see a Malaysian story on a on on the international stage that didn't that was still a Malaysian story while being on the international stage if that makes sense uh, damn it stop saying that. Um, I've never noticed how much I've said it so much ex until I got to this session. Okay, um, but yeah, I've had people say things like, you know, your book made me start talking to my mom about May 13th. Your book made me start asking my grandparents what they were doing on May 13th. Um, I, I was approached by someone at an event that said they were reading it with their, she's in her 40s, and she was reading it with her um, like 19 or 20 year old son and then the, the 60 something, 70 something grandmother was like, what are you reading? I want to read it too. So they read it as a family, all three generations bringing different perspectives to it and I thought that was really cool. If all it does is make you start interrogating your own family history, to me that's great. Just start thinking about it. Um, and and that I have heard stories to that effect, which is really nice. Um, I'm going to answer your third question first because it's much shorter. Because second question is process, and that's just okay. Your third question was Malaysian writers who inspire or storytellers. Um, there is a. I'm going to talk about the current stuff. There is a book at the Ilham Gallery right now by Zidek Su and Sharon Chin called Creatures of Near Kingdoms. That book is fantastic. Published locally, whether you're talking about a local publication or an international publication. That book has so much imagination on every page of it, and Sharon Chin's artwork for that is amazing. Um, so you're already here. If you want to read a local, a local author, please go to the Ilham Gallery shop and buy Creatures of Near Kingdoms. Um, I'm going to tell we him. We forced her to say that. <laughs> no, really. Zidek is a friend of mine, but, and, and, and my blurb is on the back cover of it. So I got to read an early version of it, but also that book is just great. That book is great. Um, and there's so much, and to me, it just shows that there's so much, there's so much here, like so much potential and so many stories that we, we, are, we want to tell that haven't reached a wider audience yet. Um, and I really do think that local audiences need to give local authors a chance as well. Um, but yeah, um, all you have to do is walk along here and look at the artwork on the walls. I've taken so many pictures since I've been here because I want to reread these stories and look at these pieces all over again. Inspiration is everywhere. Everywhere. And there are so many authors and artists and locally just doing really cool things. Okay, the second question is a very long answer. Okay. The process of getting published by a New York publisher it involves a lot of waiting. Um, here's what you have to do. You have to finish the book first and you have to polish it up to the best of your ability on your own. That means you send it to beta readers or critique partners, you get other people to read it, you take their feedback. 
obviously you don't take their feedback wholesale. You decide for yourself which feedback makes sense for your story. Fine, you polish it up, you edit it, whatever. When you think the story is ready, you start researching literary agents. Big publishers in the West, in the UK and the US, will not take man unsolicited manuscripts, or very rarely take unsolicited manuscripts. That means your manuscript has to come in through a literary agent. Otherwise, you're spam, and they get rid of your stuff. So, uh, and we're talking big publishers like Simon & Schuster, Harper Collins, Penguin Random House, like those big names that you see. So you need a literary agent. To get a literary agent, you have to have your completed book. You have to write a query letter, which is like an email that's pitching your story to the agent. Um, and that reads a lot like the back cover of a book. You know, the description you see, it's, an, it's a description enough to entice, uh, it, to hook the agent in and make them want to read more. And generally, you send the query letter along with the first maybe three chapters of your book. Guidelines will differ by agencies, but it's usually about three chapters or the first 5,000 words or whatever. And you send that along. You don't even send the full book yet. You don't send an attachment or anything because they're just going to ignore you. You send that first. If they are interested, if your query has managed to hook them, if your first few pages has managed to hook them, then they will ask you for either a partial, which is the first 50 pages of the manuscript, or a full, which is the whole manuscript. And if they like that, then they might offer to represent you. A few things to note. Each step of this, to get feedback from the agent, they will tell you might take up to six to eight weeks at each step of the process. So you send your query, six to eight weeks, huh? you must wait. You, you can't like, go bugging the agent, being like, have you read it? Have you read it? Have you received my query? What's going on? Even though that's what you're thinking in your head in a constant loop. You're not allowed to go and say that to, to the agent, right? Because when you think about it, they get hundreds of these queries in a day, in a week, in a month. Like, you know how many they get. Like, there's so much backlog. So you wait six to eight weeks at each stage. If you, if you are lucky and the agent connects with your work, they will offer to represent you. Um, if you are very lucky, multiple agents will offer to represent you and then you will be in the very privileged position of having to choose between them. Uh, and then when that happens, um, you choose your agent, you sign a contract to each other, you don't pay your agent anything. You never, the author never pays their agent. Their agent takes a commission from what uh, they sell for you. So they'll take a percentage of your advance, if you get an advance, and they'll take a percentage of the royalties, if you get the royalties. It's fine. Uh, so once you have an agent, you might workshop the book together, you might edit it together, she might have feedback to make it stronger, um, and then your agent will create a list of uh, editors, and potential editors that she thinks would be the best fit for the book. So editors, uh, pot potential editors and the best like imprints of publishing houses that she thinks where your book would fit the best. Um, and then you go on submission and that's more waiting. <laughs> that's not six to eight weeks anymore, that's like months. Like you can be prepared to wait months. Um, and they'll send your submission in batches. So they might send 10 editors first and then wait and see what happens. And if nobody bites in that first round, then they'll send it again to another different ten. Until you dis either your book sells or they decide that it's dead, like nobody wants it, we'll have to move on to the next project. So in my case, um, I started writing it in December 2016, finished in February of 2017. Yes, that sounds very fast. Uh, I did not sleep much in this period. <laughs> I have two small children. Uh, I wasn't sleeping anyway, so I figured I might as well be productive. Um, so it was written by February 2017. I sent it to beta readers, got their feedback. I signed, I started querying in March 2017, and I signed with my agent in April 2017. And she had sold my book by May. I don't want anybody to think this is a typical trajectory. It's not. The stars aligned for me, like I said. I was very lucky. Uh, at every stage, things happened much more quickly than they're supposed to. And that's not to say that my book was better than somebody else's or worse or whatever, like, like somebody else's was worse or whatever. It's just how it happened for me. Um, and I always want to put that caveat in because I don't want authors to give up 
so easily like they say, oh, you got it in a month, therefore I have to get it in a month. That's not how it works. Sometimes it's just timing. Sometimes it's just luck. But anyway, she sold my book. Um, I, and I was in a privileged position of having like five offers to choose from, five agents to choose from. So I could, I could go with the one that I felt was best for me. Uh, but yeah, I sold my book in, she sold my book in May. It was announced in June and then it came out two years later. <laughs> More waiting, as I say. But um, yeah, that's how it happened for me and generally that's how it happens. Obviously, there's nitty gritty stuff that goes on at every other stage of that, but uh, we can talk about that more after this if you like. But uh, that's a very basic overview of it. Yeah. And Thank I think you. this. Yes, we have one last, one last question. Hi. <coughs> Hi, I'm Chloe. Um, I just first, I would like to thank you for portraying OCD as accurate as possible. I study psychology. So, um, first question um, for a person who are interested in digging in more into, di digging deeper into the main, on the main issues, riot issues and uh, OCDs, is there any credible source that you would recommend? Except uh, Malaysia Kinis for me. And second, do you have any plan for your next books? Oh, yeah. okay. <laughs> credible sources. Um, to be honest, it depends what you're looking for. Uh, Quas books on May 13th are probably the most widely known and available books on May 13th that there are out there. Um, you have to understand that this isn't a thing that people talked about a lot or wrote about a lot until probably fairly recently. So um, in terms of sources, like hard and fast sources, besides the, I think the reports that came out this year honestly are some of the, the better ones, like the most researched ones, the most well-researched ones, and they make a good jumping off point for then finding more specific resources, um, which is why I recommended the Malaysia Kini microsite in particular, because they wove in video and stuff like that, and audio into that presentation, and it's, it's really cool. Um, the, the OCD part of it, mental illness, uh, that's actually also really difficult to find solid sources for. And you would know this, working in the field that you do. It's very hard because, again, they, I'm not telling you anything that you don't know, but for the benefit of the rest of the audience, like, living in the context that we live in, we can't take the research from the West wholesale and treatment options from the West wholesale and apply it to our society here. It just doesn't work that way. Um, and, and we're still, I think, in the process of figuring out how to melt what they have done and what they know and what they research and, and put it in a very specifically Malaysian context. And we're not there yet. We're not there yet. So research is very, even for my first book, like for the nonfiction book, research was very difficult because there was so little literature available to us. Um, so honestly, I wouldn't be able to answer that question. In fact, I think you probably have more access to that type of research or resources than I do. Um, I just, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't even know. Uh, I read a lot of like academic papers and stuff about it, but um, even then the data was always difficult to, to trust because, because of the context that we operate in. So um, I'm sorry about that. But uh, next projects. Okay, I gotta talk about this. Um, I only got to talk about this like a month ago, so I'm still very excited about it. But uh, next year, I have a book coming out in August, September of 2020 from HarperCollins, and it's my first middle grade book, which is for readers aged 8 to 12. Um, and it is about a girl who inherits a ghost, a Malay girl, of course, who inherits a ghost. Uh, and who lives in Malaysia as well, because I'm never going to write stories that don't take place in Malaysia. But it's about a girl who inherits a ghost and doesn't realize what it is and um, grows up making it her like, best friend slash companion and then gets older and realizes that that's a real problem. <laughs> that's a real problem when you try to get buddy-buddy with a ghost. Um, so that comes out next year in, from HarperCollins in, uh, in 2020. And I'm also part of an, a middle grade anthology coming out from Abrams Kids. Um, who published things like the Diary of a Wimpy Kid and all that stuff. Um, and it is an anthology of, uh, of stories about Eid, about Hari Raya, um, from Muslim authors from all different backgrounds all over the world. Um, and that's really exciting as well, because that's not a thing that you've seen in mainstream 
widely like global English literature for kids. You haven't really seen anything like that. So those are two projects that are coming out in 2020. I'm currently working on a second YA book that I am hoping <laughs> to be done with at some point because I feel like I've been working on it forever. But yeah, uh, two things next year and then hopefully more after that. <laughs> Okay, we'll wrap. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Is your question in three parts or? <laughs> it's yeah, just one question. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> we do. Uh, yeah. Actually, that gentleman was first, so. The, yes. Okay. Yeah. I'm very sorry. Very sorry about that. Yeah. We're just running very short of time. Okay. So, thank you very, very much for being such a responsive audience. I'm so sorry we couldn't take the last two questions, but as Hannah said, she's available for the weekend apparently. So, no, I'm you kidding. You don't understand. I left my kids yeah. with my yeah. husband. I'm like, you can keep me as long as you want. Yeah. So, a nice break. Thank you for all the great questions. And Hannah, I think everyone here will join me in wishing you all the very best for your next, uh, for your publications that are upcoming, for your, for your book that you're writing now. And uh, please keep doing it. Okay, thank you for coming.